Welcome to The Better Buy, where I give you the information you need on the stuff that you want so that you can make the better buy. In this case, we're talking about the Action 4, which is the new king of action cameras. GoPro is dead. They haven't been innovating for several years, and DJI has stepped it up. Now, I'm going to tell you seven things that nobody else has talked about on the internet, and if any one of them are something new for you, would you please like this video, throw a comment down below on which one it was, and that helps me out, and it keeps me motivated to keep this stuff going. Let's get into it. So the first thing that nobody has talked about is the limitations on the screens. While there are two really nice screens that are touch screens that you can use, you can't use both of them at the same time. You have to unlock the one that you're using, and if you unlock the back screen, the front screen gets locked. The reason that matters is that when you're filming, if you're filming at 1080p, a above 100 frames a second, it's going to blank out whichever screen you haven't unlocked last. So if you wanted to watch yourself in the front screen, you better make sure that's the last one you unlocked. For some reason, in 2.7K, it doesn't do that. You can view both screens while recording up to 120 frames per second. That's kind of weird to me. And another thing that's a little odd is that in 4K, you only get up to 60 frames per second. Once you get past 60 frames per second, you have to pick which screen you want to view while you're recording, and you have to do it before you press record. So if you've unlocked the front screen first and then you press record, you're not going to be able to see anything in the back screen. If you've unlocked the back screen last, when you press record, you won't be able to see yourself in the front screen. These are things that nobody's talking about. Horizon balancing is a wonderful form of stabilization where it keeps the ground level so that as you move the camera back and forth, it stays flat. Here's the problem. For this camera, you can't use it above 60 frames per second. 1080p 60, 2.7K 60, 4K 60, anything above those frame rates and you lose horizon balancing. Also, if you're in the 4x3 aspect ratio, you can't use horizon balancing. You're locked into that rock steady plus stabilization that they have. Just something to be aware of when you're getting the camera. Absolutely nobody has been talking about the low light ghosting that goes on with this camera, and I'm going to show you evidence of that later on in this video. Here's the thing you need to understand. While everybody's bragging about how great this thing is in low light, nobody talks about some of the issues that are taking place while you're filming in low light, and I have tons of video that shows that quality and the ghosting that takes place. Some of the jittery stuff that happens in the background as well takes place in the low light filming. So I think you're going to want to stick around to see that evidence so you can understand why you need to be aware of that if you're looking to get this camera, especially if you're planning to film in the dark. I haven't heard anybody talk about the voice control limitations for the Action 4. Anything above 4K 60 and you can no longer control the camera by saying start or stop recording. That's something that you should be aware of if you're trying to film slow-mo stuff and you plan to be doing it hands-free. The same thing also plays out at 1080p for 120 and 240. Just be aware you won't be able to use your voice to control the camera. However, 2.7K lets you use it all the way through 120, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. 2.7K seems to be the magic place where stuff just keeps working anyway. I noticed something weird in the background of my videos, which was the jittery, glitchy effect happening when you're filming with the stabilization on, and I haven't seen anybody talking about this, and it's something that you should be aware of if you're thinking about buying this camera. It's not a major issue. I still love the stabilization. At the end of the day, I still think this camera is the best action camera on the market. However, it's something that's happening, and I'll show you some evidence of that later on. Now this is one that actually blew my mind. It takes seven clicks, seven taps to delete the footage on this camera. That's insane to me. I'm going to show you that later in the video when I walk you through it, but the fact that it takes seven different individual taps to get to the point where you can delete the footage is absurd. DJI needs to simplify that process. It should take no more than three taps to get you to where you can clear the footage and keep going because that's something that you do regularly. You're regularly going to be clearing this footage. Let's make that the simplest process that it can be. All right? So if any one of those was something that you haven't seen anywhere else on YouTube, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, comment down below which one it was, help me grow because my goal is to build out a channel that's focused on you, the consumer. I know that there's big companies that sponsor people. I'm not that person. I might get sponsored in the future. I'm not against sponsorship as long as it doesn't impact the way that I make my videos because my goal is to share with you the things that nobody else is talking about so that you can make the better buy. So now I'm going to walk you through the camera in a chronological fashion as you would experience it if you pulled it out of the box. Let's get into it. First off, the camera itself, when you pick it up, when you hold it, it's got some nice weight to it. It feels like a sturdy, well-made thing. And I think part of that's because of what's going on in the bottom. The fact that I could pop it off the top right there really quickly is another reason why this is significantly better than the GoPro in all sorts of levels. DJI is actually innovating with the action camera market. GoPro is basically just reiterating what they've done before. Not that great. Now, one thing that I like is the textured plastic on this guy is much easier to hold on to. It's not like the slippy plastic of the GoPro. And when you get this, you're going to get the 
frame that comes with it. You're gonna throw your camera right in there for safety. And the only thing that it stops is you can't get to the battery or the US, uh, the SD card. However, because you can get to the USB-C, I just use that to transfer all my footage anyway. So that would be an easy one to do. It's a vertical one, okay? Just something to be aware of. But um, that's gonna be just an easy way to protect the camera while you're using it. And I love that they give you that. So I think that increases this camera's durability. They also include an extra lens guard in the adventure combo. So that's huge for me. Cause you know, you're gonna scratch this at some point. It'd be really nice to just have the replacement ready to go. I love the DJI did that. And then you can swing this guy back on here vertically if you want to. What I've found is the four by three aspect ratio does a great job um, just to be able to reframe. But if you really wanted a full nine by 16, easy way to get it. And I love that DJI really thought that through and I'm happy for them for doing that for us. We can't talk about durability without addressing the fact that this thing can go 18 meters underwater, which is deeper than the GoPro, which is once again, a win for DJI. So when it comes to durability, this thing is crushing it. When you get the adventure combo, you're going to get this battery pack. And I absolutely love the way they designed this. It's just, it's just, it makes sense. You can easily plug in a battery pack to this thing to charge while you're going. And because you could charge three batteries at a time and well, you're going to have one in the camera, obviously, but you can, you're always going to have a battery charged when you get this whole setup, which is just going to make your life that much easier. And like, you don't have to worry about running out of battery because when you do, you just pop in a new one and keep going. That's really nice. One thing that you should know is that this thing will fast charge in 18 minutes. You're going to get up to 80% of a battery back, which is awesome. And I took this thing out and ran for over an hour with it and it dropped to 57%. It was on the entire time I filmed for more than 30 minutes and that should let you know that this thing can crush battery life. I then went on to film with my kids in the pool, which is going to be some of the video that I show later. And the thing just kept going. So you don't have to worry about battery with this guy. You're going to be fine. When it comes to ease of use, there's two different categories. One is the physical item that we're gonna be using and how we're gonna use it. And the other one is the technical interaction. So as far as the physical item, this thing destroys the GoPro because you can just quickly snap it onto the mount. So if you have mounts in multiple different places around your house, car, wherever you're using this camera, the ability to move the camera is significantly faster than with a GoPro. Obviously you also have the ability to switch to a vertical mode without even trying as, as long as you have the frame on it. So that's pretty awesome. And now let's talk about the technical use because that's gonna be the part where things get a little bit interesting. It's pretty quick, it's very snappy, the menu systems are nice. However, there's a few things that are obnoxious like the seven taps to delete some footage. When I said it takes seven taps to delete the footage, I wasn't kidding, watch this. I have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is absolutely absurd. This is not the way you should have to go through to delete footage. That doesn't make any sense. Let's just quickly run through some of the menu options so that you can see some of the stuff that's going on here. All right, first off, if you swipe down, you're gonna get into these settings. If you tap this one, it's gonna change the front screen from full screen to the actual dimensions of what you're filming, whether it's 16 by nine or the four by three. I'll show you that in a second. You get your screen brightness right here really quickly, which is nice. I do love that, very easy to use. You also get some account stuff, some lock screen stuff, and then here's all the rest of your settings. As far as this is concerned, easy to use, makes sense, love it, okay? Now, when you want to get to other video settings, you're going here. I don't know why they have a slow-mo option because you can just change your frame rate when you're filming to 120 or whatever. So I don't quite know why they would bother with that, but it's there for you. If you swipe up, that's where you're gonna get all of the actual camera settings. They did this really well. However, I don't like how many taps it takes to get to like the, the um, software that's stabilizing it. So just be aware of that. It's just a couple extra taps. And if you're switching through it a lot, it's annoying. But if you do it once or twice, it's not a big deal. This all slides really easily, which is nice. This slides really easily. You only get five different things. You've got 1080p and then 2.7K at 16 by nine and four by three. And you get 4K at 16 by nine and four by three. That's all you get. So not complicated. I think it gives you everything that you really need. And then if you want to, you can tap this to change loop duration. I'm not doing any sort of looping stuff. So that doesn't matter for me. 
okay? And that kind of covers like the basics of, of the uh, settings for the camera. What I want to show you now is the front screen and how you interact with that. When you're working with the front screen, if you haven't already unlocked it, you have to unlock it to be able to use it, which is a swipe up. If you swipe down, you're going to be getting into your quick settings, which we were just talking about. It's really nice to be able to just switch these back and forth on the front screen. If you swipe up, you're going to get access to the camera settings. So we can go to 4K uh, 4x3, which what you see right now is the 4K 4x3 on the screen. Okay. So you can see exactly how much screen real estate you're getting. If I tap here and I go 16 by nine, it's going to shrink that a little bit, but it lets you see exactly what you're getting within the frame. If you tap on the battery, it'll show you exactly what the battery is. So 88%. I love that feature. If you swipe from this side, sorry, if you tap on this side, you're going to get all of your settings for white balance, auto and all that kind of stuff. So that's really nice. A few things you can't do advanced image enhancement for low light if you're filming in some certain stuff that I'll talk about later. So just be aware of that. And then obviously you've got your wind noise on and off and channel stereo. So that's pretty straightforward. All of that makes for a really easy use case for the consumer, which is better than the GoPro. So once again, a win. When it comes to audio quality on this camera, you've got two basic options. You click over here, you can turn wind noise on or off, and then you can change this channel from stereo to mono. That's all you get. But one thing that's nice about the action camera is the DJI has their wireless mics that you can plug right into the side and get high quality wireless audio, which is huge. So I love that. And that's where I think like the audio can take it to the next level, obviously. However, what I found filming outside, it does a pretty good job with wind reduction. I found that my voice was very clear throughout it. I'll play some of those clips later, or maybe even now. I don't know when I'm gonna put them in, but. What up, welcome to the Better Buy. Out here on a run. It's a very windy day, so I'm curious to see how the uh, Action 4 handles it. Currently filming at 2.7K, 30 frames per second with horizon balancing on. This is more than likely the one that I would use if I was out running and doing stuff. So I'm seriously backlit. It's super bright outside. That's actually a good thing to test. So we'll see how it's going with the audio and everything. Cars are going by. One just flew by right there. See how that goes. I'm going to turn this guy around just so you can see how the audio sounds when you're behind it. If I was filming something and talking, what would it sound like? Especially on a windy day if I was moving. Also, I think the horizon leveling, it looks pretty good to me. We'll find out, but it looks pretty good. Sun's facing right at me right now. This is 2.7K. I just want you to see how the camera handles everything. It's on auto. You know, so obviously you could set your own settings, but I think most people, maybe not most people, but a lot of people, are gonna be trying to just use the camera simply. It's pretty simple, but if you know how to set for exposure, white balance, all that kind of stuff, frame rates, you could obviously improve the image. I'm also not filming in D-Log, so this is all straight out of camera. It's just the normal profile. They only give you two options for that, which that's a little disappointing. Hope this audio is halfway decent. That's, that's going to let you see kind of exactly what you're getting for the audio side, and I think it does a really good job. Now I already talked about video quality, but let's run through the settings really quickly. The first thing I'm gonna do is turn off the sound so that it's not quite as loud, which is where I go into this part right here. I tap this, I'm gonna go to mute, and then that way we don't have that clicking sound throughout the rest of this video. From here, I'm gonna tap on this and I can scroll all the way through these. So I've got 1080p right there, and with 1080p I can go from 24 all the way up to 240. It is at 50 hertz, so it recommends 200. I don't know why they do that, but they do do that. So just be aware of that. And then we've got 2.7K. Once again, they're recommending the uh, the other frame rate, but 2.7K, 16 by nine, goes from 24 all the way up to 120. The four by three only goes up to 60 frames per second. So that's something to be aware of. The 4K, uh, 16 by 9 goes up to 120, but 4 by 3 once again only goes up to 60 frames per second. And that covers 
all of your resolutions. I'm not focused on time lapse, hyperlapse, all those other things right now. I'm just focusing on the video aspect. And that's what we got. The first issue that I noticed with low light was a ghosting that takes place. I'm gonna have the footage playing on the right side of the screen right now so you can see. But you'll notice that as I'm moving, my shoulder is like, it's got like a ghosting effect where it's like left behind. Same thing happens with my elbow. It's just kind of weird that it's doing that. And so that's just something to be aware of that when you're filming in low light, if there's a lot of motion, you're gonna get that. That happened with the low light enhancement turned on and with it turned off. That didn't seem to affect it. But one thing that was weird is the low light enhancement, or maybe just in general, they were really kind of smoothing stuff out to try and eliminate some of the graininess, but it ended up with some weird looking footage, which you can see playing right now. Like if you just look at the ground, you look at the textures, stuff just seems off because of the way that they're kind of handling that. So personally, I would say don't even bother turning on the image, low light image enhancement, and in general, recognize that you're gonna get mm, it's not great footage when it's low light. However, if there's a little street light, gets a little better. Another thing that I noticed while filming in low light was a background jitter or glitch that was going on that I talked about earlier. And you can see that playing on the side where if you look at like the sign and some of the trees, there's just this weird glitching, jittering effect going on whether it's just the low light that's causing that or the stabilization in general that's causing that. What I will say is I did not notice that issue when I was filming in normal daylight. So I think that there's something going on with the low light that's causing that, probably kind of tied to that whole ghosting effect, except it's doing it differently with those items. It's just something that you should be aware of when you're buying the camera. I think it's not a deal breaker, but you know, it is something that's nice to know. Now the two videos that are gonna be playing next to me right now deal with 4K at 50 frames per second and 4K at 25 frames per second filmed back to back. So you can see how different they look in low light. And what I would say is it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. I was hoping that if I dropped down to 25 frames per second, that the, the footage would maybe get a little bit brighter and maybe a little bit cleaned up. Didn't seem to make that much of a difference. I was just a little after sunrise, but not much. We're talking minutes. And so it's still pretty, you know, golden hour outside and I think that that is just something any of these smaller action cameras with the little tiny sensors are going to struggle with. So just be aware of that. I know that they like to tout this whole thing as like the low light king now and maybe there's some ways you can improve the low light stuff but this is all filmed in auto so this is what most people are probably going to experience and it's just nice to know once again that it's there. I did want to briefly address the four by three aspect ratio because I was considering that for use for what I do because I like to do running and filming and it's nice to be able to have both things for the multiple social media. And you can reframe this reasonably. I think it works fine. It's not quite as wide as I would like when you're in the four by three or you know whichever way you wanna do it. You're kind of sacrificing a little bit on both sides, but it can be reframed. If you held the camera right, you could definitely get it. If you use the extension rod, you know, the selfie stick to get out a little further, you would certainly clear up any space issues that you have. So overall, I would say that the four by three works and it's something that you could count on if you want to do any sort of reframing with your own footage. When it comes to stabilization, I basically only used Rocksteady Plus and the Horizon Balance. The Horizon like lock, the thing that lets you spin the camera, is not something that most people would ever need to use. Like, why are you just spinning the camera? However, the Horizon Balancing lets you rotate the camera up to 45 degrees either way, and it keeps the horizon level. All right, so we're now at 2.7K at 50 frames per second with the Horizon Balancing on, and uh, that's what you get. I am purposely rocking the camera back and forth, but it shouldn't be doing much to the frame. We'll see. All right, I'm holding the camera steady now. Purposely trying to get as nice a shot as I can. And hopefully that makes a difference. I understand why they can't do the horizon balancing in the four x three, but it's kind of disappointing. So, that's basically all anyone is going to be doing if they're if they've got a little jitter in their hand or something's moving a little bit then that's going to give you the little bit of horizon balancing you need to keep everything level however something to note is that if the horizon gets off a little bit which i'm showing on the side here or on the side there whichever way it is um you're going to see that like i end up with a with a crooked horizon and I'm going that way with a crooked horizon. So a little bit of work needs to happen there. Just be aware of that when you're filming that maybe make sure that you start, 
you know, solid when you press the record button, and that should help with that. If you start sideways, maybe that'll be an issue. Just something to be aware of. And then the Rocksteady Plus, really good stabilization. The only thing with that is that if you do tilt the camera, then the whole thing tilts as well. And you can see that happening on the side right now. So be aware of that when you're working with the, the camera, the footage, when you're thinking about which stabilization you're gonna use. If you know that you're worried about a little bit of rocking, go with the horizon balancing. If you're not worried about that and you're just gonna kinda keep this straight but there's gonna be some up and down motion, probably go with the rock steady, okay? I've been using the Go 3 for over a month now, every single day basically. Their stabilization, I think is the best in the business, especially when you have like the glitching effect going on in the background of this one for whatever reason. And this is very close. Like if you showed me footage of both of these on average, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one was which if it was solely based on the stabilization. The quality of the footage in this one is clearly better than the Go 3, except for in the low light. Low light, everything kind of falls apart for both of them. I mean, up to a point. Um, but you can definitely see the video quality difference in this one when you're looking at the footage in the computer. Once it's uploaded to YouTube and it's processed and all that good stuff, then maybe not so much of a difference. But as far as the stabilization goes, these are both really, really good at stabilization and they're both better than the GoPro, which has good stabilization as well, which is not as good. One thing that I think is important to note about the DJI versus the GoPro is that when you are using the phone as a separate viewing screen, you know, you've got this somewhere else. When you're recording with the DJI, you can still see on the phone while it's recording. If you're doing that with the GoPro, you lose visual as soon as you press record. So if you've got this outside your car, you're recording and you wanna watch what's going on with your phone, that's really nice to be able to do. On a side note, the Go 3 does that as well, but it's just here. So like I'll have this in my car, I'll have this outside my car and I'll be filming and I can see exactly what I'm getting right here. I love so many things about the Go 3. I will say the camera quality on this sucker, the 240 frames per second at, at um, 1080p, the 124, the 4K 120, like those are beautiful. I mean, the slow motion on this, mm. Watch this footage on the side here. Watch me jump into the water. You see this? Like you can slow this down so much. You can watch every frame taking place. I absolutely love that. So I do, I, I do look forward to the day when this has higher resolution, more frame rates. I'm sure that's coming. But for now, this thing kills it. And it's a beast and I love it. And then the last thing that I wanted to discuss was this little auto white balance sensor. That thing is amazing. I'm gonna put some footage on the side. I'm gonna play it in normal, normal speed first so you can see what happens. My daughter is above water, she goes underwater, or the camera rather. What I want you to notice is how the camera transitions the white balance. And like the water is green, and then it goes to just a well white balanced view. This thing crushed that. So I use the word crush a lot, but I'm honest about that. It, it just, when you see it happen, you literally watch the camera correct the white balance as it's happening. Like slow motion makes it more obvious, but it does such a good job doing it. So the camera is sick. The DJI Osmo Action 4 is an incredible action camera that is going to cover all of your camera needs, especially in the action category, for a long time. And now let's wrap this sucker up. I have covered a ton of stuff about this camera and I am confident that some of it, a great deal of it probably, is things that you haven't seen anywhere else on YouTube. And if that's true, once again, please like the video, subscribe to this channel. I'm gonna give you everything you need on the stuff that you want to make the better buy. Comment below one thing that stood out to you that you didn't know before, because that helps me. I know people don't always wanna, you know, subscribe to stuff or join a Patreon or things like that. That's the easiest, freest way to help somebody that's trying to help you. So I'd really appreciate it. Now, my final thoughts on these cameras. Obviously, you should know by now, this thing defeats the GoPro 11 by a landslide. It's not even worth the conversation to me, but you've seen me walk you through it in this video. It beats it in battery. It beats it in durability. It beats it in um, ease of use. It beats it in functionality. It beats it in, in quality of stabilization. It beats it in low light. It just beats it. So it beats it in like versatility, like the, the, the creativity and design. These guys are actually innovating. GoPro just doesn't seem to be doing that. For whatever reason, they're really focused on other stuff. Maybe they're gonna switch that up with the 12, I don't know. What I can say is if you decide to get this camera, no matter what GoPro comes out with, you're not gonna be disappointed that you have this one. 
GoPro is not going to go out and make some crazy change. They're probably still going to have battery life issues. They're probably still going to have overheating issues. They're going to try and throw out some bonus frame rate stuff kind of things to try and draw people in and maybe some 8K, 6K, whatever craziness they think they can pull off without major overheating. At the end of the day, I am confident this camera will be better than the Hero 12 in most categories to the point where it shouldn't be worth even considering the 12, no matter what GoPro is thinking. Now, what about the Go 3? Can you even compare these two? Here's my thoughts. The Go 3 is a very unique, very different kind of camera. And when you get this one, you're not paying for image quality, frame rates, and stuff like that. What you're paying for is creative freedom. You're paying for the ability to take this thing places that you wouldn't have gone with the action for, to think about filmmaking differently. And that's where I think you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to do with an action camera? Is video quality and all the other stuff that I mentioned, you know, the most important? Then definitely go with the Action 4. I haven't talked about the Go 3 in this video, but it's linked up top. You've seen it pop up a few times. And at the end of the day, this thing does a great job in many categories. So maybe it's the better buy for you. If you told me that I had to pick one of these two cameras and I couldn't have them both and I was going to just stick with one of them, it's the Action 4. Okay, that's the one that I'm going with. I do lose some of the things that I absolutely love about this camera. There's a lot of things that I love about this camera. Um, but I'd be willing to give those up for, for what this thing can do anyway. Yeah, I'm going to have to rethink the way that I film some of my stuff. And this is a little bit heavier. And like, uh, I, there's a lot of things that I would miss. Because one of my favorite things about this is the hat clip. The chest mount now is something that I've come to enjoy. The magnetic the tat, it, there's a lot of things that I love about this camera, but if I had to pick, the Action 4 is the one that I would go with. Thankfully, I don't have to pick, and maybe you won't either. Maybe you'll just get both of them and add them to your camera arsenal, and you're going to freaking love them. The links are down below. Obviously, using my links helps me out, but really, I hope that this video helped you out. That's the goal of all of this. Again, I want to give you the information you need for the stuff that you want so that you can make the better buy. That's all I got for you. I hope that you're having a good day. I hope that you at least enjoyed this and benefited from it. And I will see you in the next one. All right, so this is just a test of the audio. I mainly like, how does the audio handle when you've got water in the environment and uh, it's getting into the mics and all that kind of stuff. So. I don't really know how it's going to go, but it's it's going, so that's what we're doing. Right, Sky? Dang, I love that uh, camera. The, the quality is kind of insane, for sure. <laughs> hey, Daddy, let's try catching Sky. She's right there. Where you can catch her. Now we're going to catch her. Catch her, catch her. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Catch Skyla. <laughs> catch that Skyla. What? That's nice. That's you.